Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Siefkin, and I'm the Executive Director of the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm very excited to uh, welcome you to the second annual Technology, Sustainability, and Business Forum. Uh, so this forum is actually brought together by the Tepper School of Business in partnership with the Carnegie Mellon Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. My first, obviously today, I just wanna to welcome all of you to this important session today with these incredible panelists um, and just take a minute or two to give a couple of thanks and to, um, to talk a little bit about the Scott Institute before we dive into today's uh, content with our panelists. So first I'd like to say a special thank you uh, to all of you for joining us uh, from all over the country. We're so glad to have you here. I wanna say a special thank you to our panelists. And I would also like to give a special shout out to Nick Muller and Daniela Greenman for their work on today's programming. The Scott Institute um, is a part, it's an uh, university-wide initiative within Carnegie Mellon University um, that's really focusing on a sustainable low carbon energy future through partnerships, programming, um, and activities much like this one. Um, we have a recently um, uh, published annual report called Impact, where we talk about our key areas for research in terms of energy, technology, efficiencies, and computation. I'd also like to mention that uh, Nick Muller is a fellow, an energy fellow with the Scott Institute. Uh, we have other upcoming programming, um, including on December 3rd, Rita Barrenwell, who's the Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy for the Department of Energy, is actually our guest speaker, December 3rd at 11 a.m. Eastern. And we're having a round table talking about all things Pittsburgh, um, specific to the city of the future and district energy planning in partnership with the Danish Energy Industry and Agency. Uh, that should be of interest to many of you on December 10. I also want to let you know that our uh, Energy Week, uh, which will be held virtually in 2021, is March 22 through 26, and I hope that you will join us online. Um, as I mentioned, um, Anna Siefgen here is my contact information. I would love to hear from you, um, and there are many ways that you can hear more about what's happening with the Scott Institute, including on our webpage, which is where you can register not only for our newsletter, but also to receive information about events like this one. So I'd like to um, uh, introduce all of our speakers today, um, and I'm looking forward to a very robust conversation. So we have Martina Chung, who's the president of SMP Global Market Intelligence. Welcome, Martina. David Evans, who's the senior economist for the National Center for Environmental Economics, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Galena Hale, who is a professor and research advisor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and a fellow, um, a research fellow at CEPR. John Hartner, who is the CEO of X1. Uh, Ryan Riordan, who is the associate professor of distinguished, uh, associate professor and distinguished professor of finance and the Director of Research for the Institute of Sustainable Finance, welcome, as well as William F. Opplinger, who is a CMU grad, an 88 Industrial Administration grad, Masters of Science, and who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Alcoa. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can see all of us. And thank you so much for all of our guests for being here today. Thank you for handing it over to us, Anna. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Penny Barnes, and I'm a current second year MBA at the Tepper School. I have a few prepared questions for the panelists that we're going to start with, and I hope you all have questions as well. There's a Q&A function in Zoom, and I'd like you to use that to ask your questions for our panelists. To begin today's session, I'd like to give the panelists an opportunity to discuss their professional role and how that pertains to the notion of sustainability. I think it would be insightful of you to begin by providing your working definition of sustainability and how you measure it. Dr. Hale, would you like to begin? Let me unmute. Um, 
Well, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nicholas, for inviting me. And uh, thank you all for putting together this event. I think it's important to have those discussions. So uh, I'm here really in two roles. Um, as an academic at UC Santa Cruz and as a research advisor at Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, where I'm currently on leave. Um, to me, sustainability means uh, really kind of what the English language means, that the human activity on Earth is not uh, going to, well, it's already doing that, but sustainability means it's not going to interfere with natural processes to the point of uh, making things disappear, including ourselves. So I'm a big fan of uh, Daniel Quinn. So if you guys haven't read uh, his books, uh, you have a lot of uh, enjoyment ahead of you. Um, in terms of, uh, so, so I think what's needed right now to ensure sustainability of, you know, human activities on the planet is that it's kind of a paradigm shift in people's minds. And so to respond to this question, then I would say um, every activity has to have sustainability as a component of it, right? So sustainability consideration. Now uh, at Federal Reserve, what I tried to do over the last three years is basically get the Federal Reserve up to speed to uh, you know, the involvement of central banking in the climate change issues, and I can talk about it later today. Um, but one reason I uh, moved recently to academia is to kind of be able to work on a broader concept of sustainability that relates to food choices and everything. And so you see Santa Cruz is particularly attuned to the sustainability issues. It's been, you know, kind of a a core interest of the of the campus for many years now. So it's it's a long answer. Sorry about that. Please feel free, panelists, to jump in if you'd like to respond as well. Sure. Hi, it's John Hartner here. Um, so uh, just like Galena said, the definition, just to start with that, I mean, I think it's about balance. Uh, sustainability is about balance. And in some ways, you can think it's sustain, maintain. Sometimes I think the challenge in the natural world is it's hard to get the time frames right or understand how that affects space. But uh, I think balance is a really important thing when we look at sustainability. Um, I spent a lot of time in Asia and yin and yang and that whole idea of balance. Um, and it, it's important for all of us, whether you're, you know, a person that is trying to use a reusable water bottle, um, as opposed to single use plastics, or someone leading a company. So I, I happen to be lucky enough to lead a company called X1. It's a pick Pittsburgh based company that is a leader in additive manufacturing or 3D printing for metal production parts. So really working with industries across across sectors to help them become more sustainable. Um, I mean, as a CEO of a public company, I think it starts with setting a vision. I've been there about two years. And so during that first year working with my team, understanding what a vision for the future could be. And, and we set our vision as sustainable manufacturing without limitations. Everyone thinks about making stuff and it's always hard and you're getting it from you know, containers across the world. And we believe in decentralized manufacturing so you can make it closer to where it's used, make it more efficiently. Um, and, and we put that vision to work in things like you know, signing up for certain uh, tasks or ESG goals within our SEC uh, documents. And, you know, I think there's um, a lot of things that will be long term. Uh, we just got to keep it in front of us, keep pushing. And, and I frankly think as a, I mean, I grew up in Pittsburgh, I was gone for 30 some years. And being back, I think in some ways, um, being from Pittsburgh, we have a little bit more of a reason to pay attention to sustainability based on when I grew up there, it was a little bit of a different city. Um, and I think we've got to prove how um, forward-looking and how sustainable it can be 
And so uh, I think that's, that's how I look at sustainability and what we, whether individually or as a, as a leader in, in a business can do. Uh, I'll go. This, sorry. No, you. This is uh, Dave Evans from EPA. So, um, first of all, thank you very much for Tepper and Scott for inviting uh, uh, me. And I, I do have to get this out of the way. The views here, I am not a spokesperson for EPA. I'm not speaking on behalf of EPA. I need to get that out of the way. Um, but, but moving on to the definition, it was kind of interesting being pitched this question because I work at EPA. And of course, I know. But sustainability is like, you know, a lot of, when a lot of people think of EPA, excuse me, think of sustainability and think of government action, they think of us, but I frankly don't think about it a lot. And so mine was, uh, you know, sort of naive at, at first, but it, it, it kind of, you know, as I looked at a lot of the literature and thinking on sustainability, it's really just long run human society and ecological function, assuring that future generations are not worse off than where we are now. That's simple to say really complicated. I personally, I kind of have a, a, a an economist view of it. You know, you you if if you're looking for sustainable actions, you're looking for places where the benefits justify the cost. It's the twenty dollar bill on the sidewalk, but it's more complex in terms of the counting because you have to take into account things like the value of environmental resources, etc. Uh, and but if you can identify places where emissions should be lower or regulatory design should be less expensive, if you pursue those you're gonna to get towards a sustainable outcome. And I think it's at least a necessary condition, maybe not a sufficient one. Um, now I say that it glosses over serious complexities that we deal with in climate change, ocean acidification, hazardous waste management, long run hazardous waste management uh, because of the challenges of what it really means to think about intergenerational equity. Do they have the same preferences? If you're gonna have the same, you know, what technology do you think they're gonna start with depending on what we do? Um, so, uh, and then one other point on this, um, because I think there's a lot that can be done now, uh, it requires identifying what can be done now in terms of these $20 bills on the side with these benefits that might outweigh the cost, but are just more difficult to measure. And what's really important, I think, is actually for our national accounts to start accounting for this. Uh, account, and, and, and there's been fits and starts and there's been political uh, tensions associated with it. I don't want to go into the detail on that, but you're not going to see these $20 bills on the sidewalk where we can make these incremental changes now uh, without actually accounting for the benefits and costs. And, and I think we all think that economic statistics we're accustomed to are very useful, but one just needs to look, the GDP went up while life expectancy went down in the United States. And you have to ask the question, okay, wait a minute. Some of those statistics aren't really broad enough. And we need to, I think when thinking about sustainability, those sort of issues of like national accounts and things like that come into consideration. Uh, maybe I'll, uh, I'll jump in again. Thank you as well for inviting uh, a cold Canadian to the, uh, to the virtual conference. I'm sure it's a little bit warmer there, but I guess I won't be able to uh, experience it. Uh, from my perspective, uh, sustainability is, um, I also think of in terms of economics, funny that a finance professor should think of things in terms of economics, but it's about not consuming more than the globe can produce, right? I mean, it might be short periods where we consume more than it can produce, but then there've got to be periods where we're consuming less. And certainly we're in a period where we've overconsumed what can be produced. And I use the term produce extremely, uh, extremely lightly um, or loosely. Uh, and we, we, I think we have to transition now into a phase where we allow the, the planet to regenerate, right? Because I think we're, you know, we're, we're cutting muscle out in terms of the ability to regenerate what we've been, what we've been consuming. And so I think we have to go into a phase where we're, you know, under consuming up to the over, over consuming. And I, I view this for the most part, I mean, as a person, I view this from, from a, a sustainability viewpoint, but as an academic and as a researcher, I view it from a sustainable, um, a sustainable finance uh, view and sustainable finance. I think in order for finance to be useful or productive in the future, we have to realize that in the past we've assumed that the environment is an unpriced, inexhaustible input to all economic activity. And certainly, at least now in 2020, we realize that it is um, that is not inexhaustible, and it actually is priced. It just has a shadow price, or up until now, it's mostly had a shadow price. And so if we want to make finance, and I think just generally economics sustainable, we have to find a way to incorporate 
uh, environmental considerations into our financial considerations and of course then ultimately into our economic considerations and so that's how i you know through the sustainable finance lens see uh, see my role and you know sustainability in general i'll jump in uh, hi i'm uh, the uh, i'm bill opplinger i'm the cfo of alcoa uh, I'll give another uh, industrial view of sustainability. We, we have a, a fairly broad view of sustainability for our company. It starts with um, really sustainability of our company. If, uh, if, if we want to positively impact the environment, the communities, our employees, we need to be a sustainable company. Um, secondly, we, we do uh, include in our view of sustainability our impact on the environment, both from a greenhouse gas perspective, also from biodiversity, uh, our impact on the communities where, in which we work. And we work in a broad spectrum of communities from uh, the middle of the Amazon rainforest to upstate New York, uh, Messina, New York. Um, and then uh, our impact on employees and, uh, and, and, and what our employees are trying to get out of life and trying to get out of our company. So, we have a pretty broad view. I don't think anybody's addressed the second part of the question, how do we measure it? Um, we try to measure it. Uh, we actually not only try to measure it, we actually pay executives uh, in part based on our sustainability initiatives. So I have at-risk portion of my income uh, based on sustainability initiatives, both in the short term and in the long term. A bigger piece in the long term because we think we can imp impact the longer term uh, and therefore uh, have a bigger piece, but we do measure it. We put out a sustainability report, we got long-term targets and sometimes we make progress and sometimes we don't make progress, but if we don't make progress, we're open and honest about it. Penny, I'll just uh, wrap it up. Um, I, uh, Martini Chung, I work at S&P, I run one of the divisions and uh, at S&P we have uh, a role in the markets where we essentially provide uh, information and intelligence uh, to facilitate decision making. And so, as you can imagine, with the, um, the growing importance and recognition of sustainability and ESG, uh, this is something that we've been thinking about uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, beyond uh, the role that we play for our clients, uh, we also have our own uh, set of uh, targets uh, similar to what Bill was mentioning. Uh, we publish our TCFD report. Uh, I think we've just published our second one uh, most recently. And, uh, and uh, we also have uh, goals across uh, the entire leadership team connected to uh, net zero target, uh, uh, diversity goals specific to uh, gender diversity as well as ethnic diversity uh, and, uh, and a number of other things uh, around, uh, around sustainability. I think to categorize um, you know, how we think about it, I think you can put it into two categories from our standpoint. One is uh, you know, looking at ESG factors and uh, within that you can, you can almost treat climate as, as a separate pillar, uh, just given the importance and the depth of analytics that needs to go into actually measuring uh, the impact for our clients on, on climate change, whether it's transition risk or physical risk. Um, second bucket or pillar is impact. And uh, impact really gets to uh, the concept that the John and, and some of the others here talked about, which is um, more closely aligned to uh, to the UN SDGs, and uh, and how we actually think about the overall impact um, that we as a company, as well as how we want to, our clients to be able to measure themselves as companies uh, relative to their contribution to uh, to society and the world at large. Thank you for that response, Ms. Chung, and all six of you. Um, we heard Dr. We heard Dr. Evans talk a little bit about this uh, during the introduction here. Each of you represents different sectors in the economy: government agencies, manufacturing, finance, and academia. How do you how do you view the role of your sector in the economy with respect to sustainability? And why don't we start with you, Ms. Chung? Uh, good, because I hadn't put my mute back on. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, we, I mean, as I mentioned, we, our role really, um, uh, in our view, is to um, provide the information, data and analytics necessary for our clients to actually make assessments uh, around uh, sustainability more generally. And, and uh, a key tenet of that uh, is the ability to help our clients um, incorporate sustainability uh, and examine which factors are financially material. Uh, so, you know, today, Penny, we serve every sector of the market. Um, you know, 
possibly some of the folks on the call say are clients of ours, uh, but we serve uh, the academic sector, governments, uh, you know, corporations, uh, banks, uh, buy side, uh, pension, pension funds, etc. And uh, what we're looking to do in, in responding to our clients' needs is to effectively help them understand how to price in uh, the risk and opportunity from, uh, from ESG. And in order to do that, we essentially have, have to collect, analyze, cleanse, and present uh, you know, quite a bit of, um, of data uh, and analytics in support of our clients. Um, our sector, specifically the financial information sector, uh, you, know, you wouldn't think of uh, as, you know, as a um, kind of high carbon uh, emitter, et cetera, but we, uh, as I mentioned, we do have very high standards for ourselves and, uh, and we work very hard as a leadership team to make sure that we uh, uphold those uh, standards against our own um, ESG scores. Uh, and then the last one I would mention is uh, there's a lot of uh, dialogue going on right now um, between industry groups like the World Economic Forum, the IBC, uh, and uh, the various uh, sort of ESG standard setters, if you like, um, GRI, CDP, et cetera. Uh, we're participating in a lot of those discussions because we do see our, one of the roles that we play is actually trying to drive some harmonization around the plethora of ESG standards and, and climate standards that are out there. Um, I, can, I can add a manufacturer's perspective maybe, uh, you know, Obviously, I mean, one of the things we talk about is changing the way the world produces. And why do I say that? Is because, you know, if you go back uh, 20 years ago, uh, you know, really the, the regions produced their own stuff, but the own products, but the change in the last 20 years, particularly with the advent of production in Asia to such a degree, I mean, I think the U.S. trade gap has gone up by $500 billion uh, over that period or you know, and that's that's a lot of goods that are produced at the lowest cost in the low, you know, low cost regions and shipped around the world, maybe uh, to a, a point of use which may or may not correspond with what what's really needed. Yeah, you know, we think if you can focus on changing the world, way the world produces and decentralized manufacturing closer to the point of use, more tailored to the needs of the customer, uh, without an excess of material, without the shipping costs potentially lighter weight and more innovative designs, you get to a situation where you do have a more sustainable supply chain. And it, it, it does kind of go broadly into the supply chain. A lot of customers, I mean, and we, we work with people that are producing rockets or, or helicopters or hand tools uh, or car automotive. Um, and all these customers are all in a, in a broad way focusing on, and, and in some cases, because of the, the COVID situation, changing their supply chain, making it more local, uh, produce where we sell. Uh, if you look at any of their recent um, lar large corporates, investor decks, they're talking about that increasingly. And those are the dialogues that we're having. I, I think it's a, you know, the, the last 20 years of moving production to low cost regions, it, it took decades to make that happen. It's not gonna change right away. But I think we're in a shift to move to more decentralized production, closer to the customer, more tailored to the needs of the customer, such that the overall outcome will be a more sustainable manufacturing footprint for, uh, for, the, for the country and for the, for the world. So maybe I'll jump in now um, and speak uh, uh, about the central bank. So, uh, and I also have to give a disclaimer, the views are only mine and don't necessarily represent the views of the Federal Reserve. Thanks, uh, David, for reminding about this. Um, so up until about five years ago, if people would say, well, central banks should start thinking about climate change, people would be surprised because there was very limited understanding of how climate-related risks affect the mandates of the central banks. And then Mark Carney gave a speech, um, you know, on the tragedy of horizons. Right? So I think one of the panelists talked about, I think maybe Ryan talked about this, is the issue is that the risks are far, far away, but the actions need to be taken now. Now, living in California, I don't feel the risks are far away. We've been pretty much unable to go outside for most of the last four months due to the wildfire smoke. And so that all feels really real and present right now. 
but going back to the tragedy of horizons, most democratic governments' horizons are very short. And the central banks are an exception of a government institution that has a long-term horizon because usually the governors are appointed for a longer time. They're not subject to the political cycle. And so the central banks could step in. And once people started thinking about that, it became really obvious that every aspect of central bank mandates is affected by the climate risks. Our macroeconomic forecasting models are affected by climate risks through its effect on, uh, on interest rates and labor productivity. The uh, banking supervision function is affected by climate risks through the transition risk on financial stability and asset prices. Uh, you know, payments are affected by extreme weather events that we've observed. Uh, you know, in the US, we also have Community Reinvestment Act, so the disadvantaged communities bear the brunt of the climate-related uh, uh, events. So, uh, and, you know, there is now a full recognition of this, and there is a network for greening financial system, which is a coalition of the willing central banks, which now includes the majority of central banks in the world. And, I, I'm hoping the Fed would join soon among the big ones. The Fed's the only one. And, you know, Central Bank of Russia is also not a member, but even Brazil and Mexico, you know, being uh, carbon exporters, they still join that because they understand the importance of those issues. So, um, you know, as as paradoxically it could have sounded five years ago, central banks might be the key in uh, trying to help the financial system uh, facilitate the necessary transition to low carbon economy by incentivizing uh, in whatever um, instruments they have, mostly through bank supervision, but also by providing uh, economic intelligence, uh, you know, in addition to what uh, Martina was talking about, you know, models of how do you uh, price climate risk, how do you price transition risk, evaluating whether asset prices are consistent with uh, transition risks and uh, physical risks that we're expecting to uh, materialize. I can jump in and give the uh, sort of a, a similar view to Galina's, not, perhaps not from the view of a central bank, but uh, from, the view of, uh, uh, from the view of an academic. Um, and so I think our role in academia is, is fairly clear, uh, which is probably a good thing, right? I mean, it, uh, our, our, job, our job as academics is first to, to generate uh, unbiased neutral evidence on what's actually going on, let's say in ESG, ESG standards, data, data provision, um, just sort of, a, a, un, I would say, I don't wanna say unpolitical, but just really an unbiased view. And, and I think that we have a secondary role is I think we are really, uh, remiss or lax in our, I don't want to say our duties, but in our, and, and really in our, in our duties to train sort of previous generations and the importance of this. And so I, I think we miss that. And I think we really need to, uh, as academics and as teachers, to step up and make sure that in the undergraduate, in the MBA programs, in the PhD programs, that we really include sustainability, sustainability lens that in terms of economics, but also in terms of sustainable finance, that we make sure that we you know, we're not trying to indoctrin indoctrinate the next generation, but make sure that everyone really completely understands that, you know, the, the models of old really missed things that are important, both from an economic and from a, an environmental perspective, and that we need to, we need to rectify that. It's not that, um, you know, it's not that all of a sudden we think that we need to say things because people are telling us that we need to say this. We really just missed it. And so I think that that goes to, um, you know, both our, our, our research or outreach and things like this, but just in general outreach. And then certainly it should be pervasive throughout, uh, throughout our teaching. Uh, and I think that's the main role, but I think it's the main role of academics just in general is to make sure that sort of those three teaching research and, and outreach, these pillars get in. And, and I think we need to catch up. I think we have a lot of catching up to do uh, on the educational front, not just the people that are currently in my undergraduate class or in an MBA class or in you know, uh, taking their PhD, but I think also past generations, we need to find a way to get out there and explain them to them in a way that makes sense, you know, the, the, the things that we sort of now know or understand or understand better. And I think that's, I think that's our role going forward. And I think we've got our work, uh, I think we have our work cut out for us because we're really gonna have to change the minds of 
a lot of people, I'm sure everyone on this panel spends a lot of time on similar panels and it's like preaching to the converted. Uh, it's, it's when you get outside of these panels or people that aren't you know, out on the street or people that just really don't know what sustainable finance in, getting, uh, getting them to listen and to, to pay attention in is hard. And I think that's what we need to, we need to do, not just talk to the people that wanna hear what we have to say. I'll, I'll jump in next. Um, uh, you know, again, representing industry, and in this case, the aluminum industry. Uh, the aluminum industry really has two roles, uh, and the first is related to our product. We, we make an extremely sustainable product, uh, and I was glad to see that John waved around an aluminum bottle. Uh, Professor Riordan is standing in front of, uh, I believe, some aluminum pillars uh, behind him. Um, all of that is infinitely recyclable. Um, when you throw a can in, uh, in the recycling bin, it can be back on the shelves 60 days later. It's not the same can, it gets melted down. Um, and it uses 5% uh, of the energy uh, to make uh, a, a recycled piece of aluminum versus making new aluminum. So we have uh, an extremely recyclable product. We need to make sure as an industry that people understand that. And that actually helps us succeed. So we have aligned interests uh, by making sure that uh, the world understands how green our product is uh, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a favorable. However, the process of making aluminum can have sustainability impacts and our uh, industry continues to need to make improvements in the process of manufacturing aluminum. Um, there are a number of areas that we can improve on. We are working on a break technology that allows the smelting process to actually generate oxygen and not generate CO2. Um, uh, we've been working on it for decades, but we've uh, finally committed to, uh, capital to making it happen. Hope to have a commercial prototype in 2024. So there is uh, a number of roles for industry uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Appleton. Um, yeah, I just want to jump in and say one other thing to, to think about in terms of the perspective of government. And, and, and Bill just picked up on it there, which was great. It, it's innovation. It's actually creating the space for innovation. If really what we're talking about is long run well-being of future generations. It's having productive capacity. It's being able to do more with less. And so in government, it's a very simple stuff, setting property rights, making sure that the, the value of innovation can be incorporated, especially when that value spills over. So I think, in, you know, it's one theme that should come up. And the other thing I just want to sort of point, you know, Bill observed, I wasn't very clear earlier, when I was talking about national accounts, when I was talking about like measuring full wealth, not just wealth from like things we normally think about in the market economy, that's the measurement part I was, I was talking about. And apologies for not being clear about that, but I think that that's an important message. Thank you. Uh, to our audience, in case you joined late, uh, we have space for you to answer or to ask your own questions. You can use the Q&A function built into Zoom to ask your questions, and we will start responding to them. Our panelists will start responding to them in about 25 or 30 minutes. My next question, I would like to start with you, actually, Dr. Evans, for this one. Are there actions that your sector could take to further sustainability goals? Are there key steps in general that firms, consumers, or government agent, pardon me, government agencies must take to maintain, wow, I'm, uh, to maintain relevance in a sustainable future? So this is one of the questions I had a harder time answering. I mean, I'm a bureaucrat. I'm not accustomed to telling people, you know, who are my senior managers, what their preferences ought to be uh, and, and how they, they, they want to, uh, Sort of spend time and resources. So frankly, I'm going to kind of punt. Um, but to, to the extent that uh, you know the concepts like sustainability are going to be relevant, it, it had to think much broader than the Environmental Protection Agency or the sort of green departments, right? And uh, components of interior, components of commerce, um, and, and sort of think more broadly. And I'm not just talking about procurement. Some of the themes that the other uh, panelists are talking about, it's really like institutionalized in the decision making of like, okay, how is this going to operate in the short term and how it operate in the long term? And I really thought Green's point was extremely fascinating about how the Fed and the central banks think more long term, because yeah, obvious, but it isn't apparent if you look at the EPA, we operate in cycles of certain things happening, certain things don't, and they're pretty close together. Um, 
one of the places though that I, I, I sort of, I, this is more from a personal perspective. I live in around DC. So I have a lot of uh, friends and actually my wife works for the, the, the Department of Defense. It's a really fascinating place to look for lessons in how to operate in a resource constrained world. And uh, back to the point about innovation. Um, so that's not really like, a, oh, what, what do you, you know, what, what should we really do or what to get out of it? But, you know, it's thinking more broadly about government again. The DOD is constantly thinking about these long-term risks and thinking about what they're going to do in a resource-constrained environment, what it's going to take. In terms of the second question about relevance, government's going to be relevant whether or not the future is sustainable or not. So that's I, I have to punt on that one. It's a challenging question. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and give give a provocative answer. Um, and again, uh, you have to remember, I'm coming at this from a specific part of industry, and that's the aluminum industry. Um, one of the things that uh, would uh, benefit the aluminum industry and certainly benefit Alcoa is if we could get a global carbon charge. Uh, it has to be a global charge. It can't allow for leakage, right? So it's easy to say, but it, it very, very difficult to implement. Um, it can't incent people to move uh, industry to China. Um, and all, all, all countries and players need to be on a, on a level playing field. But if there were a charge for carbon, um, that would motivate and incent customers to be buying from lower carbon producers. Uh, so producers that make a product that emits lower carbon uh, as, the, as they're manufacturing that product. Um, we currently have launched a, a number of products that are green aluminum products. They're guaranteed certified uh, to, to one, be low carbon and two, be sustainably uh, manufactured. Um, it's really tough to get anybody to pay a premium for, for those products. Um, and uh, we, we sell them, um, but you know, it's, it's just now where, where you can start to get a premium for them. And in the end, you want companies who um, behave in a sustainable way to earn rents, to earn outsized rents. Uh, and, uh, and we would like to get paid for that. And it's just very, very difficult. One of the things that could change that is if you had some type of a global charge for carbon. Can, can I just ask a, a question to that? Because uh, uh, as an academic, I'm always interested in that. What do you think about uh, carbon border adjustments? So the, the idea that we're going to get every single jurisdiction to introduce a global carbon charge is probably, I'm just going to say utopian. Uh, it, it might happen. Uh, but carbon border adjustments or border adjustments could be a way to at least partially rectify that. What's, what's, what's your view? Yeah, and I, I, have to, I have to admit, I'm not an expert on carbon border adjustments, um, but I, I guess my view again is if it can reward companies for acting well, um, we, we would be supportive of it. Just to give you an example, um, we, make an, we make aluminum that uh, is probably generates on average, uh, we generate, uh, let's say, um, uh, a third of the CO2 content of uh, your average Chinese aluminum producer, uh, right? So they're generating 12 tons of CO2 emissions for every ton of, of aluminum. We're generating five tons of CO2 emissions for every ton of aluminum. Still big numbers, right? We wanna, we wanna come down off of that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if, if somehow there was a level playing field and um, they had to pay or get a discount uh, on, on selling their metal, um, that would uh, really be favorable for us. So if you can accomplish that through uh, border, uh, you know, border impacts, then that, that, that's fine too. It's, uh, and, and just in a one last comment, the, it, the aluminum industry is probably, you know, historically one of the boringest industries in the world. Today, it is probably one of the craziest interesting industries in the world when it comes to uh, the confluence of trying to make money uh, and sustainability. And there is an opportunity, and I know some we're going to have some later questions. There's an opportunity in our, in our industry for the Western world players to become very green and hopefully get paid for that, which is a benefit. I would just add, though, that uh, I was on the um, uh, CFTC sub subcommittee uh, group working on uh, climate risk um, with uh, a number of 
public and private sector participants. And uh, the report uh, was published in uh, September. And the biggest recommendation was uh, establishing a price on carbon. Uh, and, and there was unanimous agreement um, amongst the 35 uh, member group on that. Um, but I think there's, I mean, you know, there are a number of other things that are going to be required here uh, as well. And it, it gets to uh, a mix of, um, you know, David mentioned innovation. Well, you know, to put that into, uh, you know, maybe give some examples around it. Um, you know, we're going to have to find ways to actually incentivize more companies to do what Alcoa has done, though, which is to to actually invest in carbon capture and storage, adaptation, remediation. And I think there's been a bit of, um, you know, very very high emphasis on on renewables. Uh, in uh, in the last uh, several years, particularly from an energy generation standpoint, um, but you know there, there's there's this is a long term bet that we're making, and so you know I think there's got to be incentives on on multiple fronts, including for uh, you know sectors of the industry that might be um, you know kind of high in, in CO two emissions today, like oil and gas. Um, you know there's 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 uh, there's definitely support that can be provided there. On CCS and, and remediation and adaptation, because those industries are going to be, um, you know, very important for you know decades to come, given the demand for energy globally. I just want to add uh, very briefly that um, you know it's important to understand that we've let this go so far from when we first became aware of the climate change issue, that by now it's uh, really, there isn't one solution, right? To, so the answer to the question, or, you know, shall we invest more in uh, greener technologies or shall we invest more to carbon capture? The answer is all of the above, right? So every sector of the economy and every industry needs to be thinking about what they can do to get us back on sustainable track because we are not on one right now. Excellent. Thank you all for those thoughtful responses. This next question, I'd like to start with you, Bill. Um, what is your view of the role that technology can or should play in promoting sustainability? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in, in technology and that technology will has and will uh, significantly improve uh, the, the, the lives of people around the world. Um, in, in our industry, there are a number of breakthrough technologies that are being worked on um, and largely they're on the process improvement side, so the manufacturing of aluminum. Again, I, I refer to a project that we have called Elysis. It's a joint venture. With, a, with another Western world uh, aluminum producer uh, called Rio Tinto. Apple is, is a major customer. Apple wants um, uh, aluminum that uh, ju doesn't generate uh, CO2 in the process of making the aluminum. Um, so you have a very good, in that particular situation, uh, you have an alignment of two major industry players, a customer who is interested in a green product and a government in the way of the Quebec government who is interested in creating jobs in, in Quebec. So you have a, an alignment of, uh, of a number of different players where hopefully we can get a breakthrough technology to work. Um, coming back to the prior comment, why are we making this investment? We're not necessarily making this investment because it makes the world better. We're making this investment because we'll think, we think we'll make uh, uh, returns for our shareholders. Um, and so it just so happens to be aligned that in this situation, we see a future where uh, green aluminum will be able to get a premium. And that's why we're making that investment because we wanna drive, drive shareholder returns. And I know that sounds like a really industrial uh, CFO perspective, but it, it is what it is. I, I can, I, sorry, I didn't, sorry, John. Uh, I just give you a perspective because I mean I don't really have a technology that I'd, I'd like to uh, promote or not promote as a, a as an academic, 
Uh, I did actually recently write a report on that. It was called a capital mobilization plan for a Canadian low carbon economy, where we looked at uh, a set of technologies that uh, have been proven to, um, well, I shouldn't say proven, you know, they're, they're, they're public reports on, on technologies that were implemented that, that reduced carbon or led to carbon abatement. And uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, in the report about, well, should we assume that technology costs are going to fall in the future? Should we assume that technology costs are going to increase? Does this mean that the cost of, you know, this was particularly a, you know, a CO2 emissions uh, re re report. Um, uh, and there was this also this, this push to, you know, is it going to get more expensive or less expensive in the future? And, you know, we looked at historical technology costs and there actually wasn't really much of a trend. And then everyone has alarm bells going off saying, ah, oh, but what about solar and what about wind? Well, you know, certainly true. Uh, carbon capture and storage in some areas has gotten much less expensive, but as it gets implemented all over the world, in fact, we've seen the, the, an increased cost of carbon capture and storage just because as we've sort of picked all of the low hanging fruit for really inexpensive implementations of technology, um, you know, we're going to farther afield where we still need to abate carbon and it becomes more expensive. All that to say, uh, is that I think technology and investing in technology and investing in technology soon is extremely important. I think we need to provide incentives uh, to invest in technology, you know, just as, as um, sorry, William was mentioning that, you know, you're really looking at investing in technologies because it's going to provide Alcoa with some rents, but there are technology that we would really like people to invest in now, not because they provide rents, now but in the future for everyone and so having some sort of a you know either a federal provincial municipal whatever it is program that sort of helps provide uh, technology investment incentives I, I think is useful the final thing is that one common refrain that i've heard when we talk about technologies are a lot of uh, firms individuals pretty much everyone thinks that delaying investment is the best path forward because magically in the future we're going to have technologies that are extremely efficient and extremely inexpensive. And that's only the case if someone invests now. We can't get magically efficient and inexpensive technologies in the future unless someone incurs costs now. And so we need to find a way to provide incentives for people to make the investments and so that these magical technologies actually do realize and you know that we can then we can benefit. So everyone delaying is certainly not. Uh, is certainly not 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 viable, and so we need to find a way, either with an industrial solution, with a you know a, you know a federal solution, some sort of way to provide incentives for these technology investments now that don't have a clear short term, you know, three month, six month, twelve month payoff. Yeah, I mean, I I just to add to the uh, Bill and Ryan's points. I mean, I I think technology is foundational to solve any big societal problem, in particular. Uh, sustainability and climate change. I mean, I, I was an engineer at one point and I kind of remember what that was about. Probably more importantly, I was a Star Trek fan as a kid. That's that's what probably inspires me to believe that technology will make a change. I spent a lot of time in my career in the semiconductor industry and there's something called Moore's Law. And that sounds cool, but it, it, it enables what we're doing right now. It enables this. And Every year when I met with Intel and we talked about their roadmap and we provided capital equipment, capital equipment meaning frames of steel and motors and displays, we had to figure out how to take that and deliver Moore's Law. It wasn't easy, but somehow with, with technology and that challenge, we were able to do it. I think the exact same thing will happen and has happened in many cases in alternate energy. And in my space of digital print or additive manufacturing, I, you know, I see some of the broader um, long-term changes that are being discussed here as being positive, you know, whether it's a carbon tax or, or, or a, a carbon border uh, tariff, um, because I think people will then be incented to think differently, to take risks, to jump into these new technologies that will solve issues that where they will take designs that they have made, maybe make a good, good margin on, but actually innovate those designs to take five parts and make them into one and it's 30% lighter and it's, you get 10 miles per gallon more or, uh, or your battery life is longer. 
Um, but it, it takes the right uh, mindset to think differently. It takes the right belief in it, and it takes some some broader incentives, as, as some of the other uh, panelists have talked about. I'll, I'll just give a personal anecdote uh, to highlight the importance of what John and Ryan were saying. Uh, so I purchased uh, an EV uh, in the summer. Very excited, you know, doing my bit. Uh, and went when eat full EV, not hybrid, because I wanted to. I wanted to, to really do my bit. And um, uh, I was coming from the city to Long Island on a trip that would normally take me two hours. And because half the charging stations were broken, and the other half were either only for Teslas, or oh, and I don't have a Tesla, uh, or uh, or only for uh, you know charging EV like. 20 miles uh, to the hour. It took me eight and a half hours with my toddler in the back of the car uh, to get to go 200 miles. So the, the lesson learned here is I'm the one who invested early. Maybe it didn't uh, get the payback. Um, but uh, and then the other thing is someone's got to, I mean, in order for this to actually get real, it's got to actually matriculate into practical things like the infrastructure to support an EV, you know, increased adoption of EVs, et cetera. Thank you for that anecdote, Ms. Chung. Uh, the next few questions that I'm going to ask, they're directed at a specific one, one of y'all, a specific member of the panel. But after they've had an opportunity to respond, I, I think we're well open to the perspectives of everyone, the perspectives of anyone else. Dr. Riordan, um, from your work, is the finance sector changing in response to demands for sustainability? Do you perceive uh, both a supply side and, de and a demand side role for financial firms? And what have been the most effective financial products that have enabled investments in sustainable business? Yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, that, that's a good question. So there are a lot of questions uh, I think that we uh, need, to, need to unpack. So certainly I have seen a change even just in the period of time that I've been focused on this predominantly as an academic. And so that's, you know, perhaps the last five years before that I, I had a, I would say a passing interest in it, uh, you know, from a sustainable perspective, but not from a sustainable finance perspective. And certainly, you know, now it's hard to, uh, it's hard to not go to an academic finance conference, an industry conference, uh, be on a conference call, take a look at an annual report, a quarterly report, or anything and not see something about uh, sustainability front and, and center. So certainly uh, large public firms, uh, also public regulators, uh, I'd say are focused uh, on, uh, on sustainability and the importance of sustainability to I think long-term sustainability of individual firms. And so the second part of the, the, the question um, is, you know, about supply side and, and demand side. And so it depends on what you mean by supply side and demand side, but let's just sort of think of supply side as firms and demand side as, as investors. Uh, I think you guys have it the other way around in the question, but you know, I just think of, uh, think of it that way. Um, so I think that firms are certainly acutely aware of the fact that they need to supply to the market some sort of a sustainability investment, either in the forms of a bond or, or equity. And so I think what they're, they're uh, I, I think there's a, a s less of a shift there. I think it's hard for some firms, maybe William, you can talk to this, but it's really hard to figure out how can I raise capital and raise capital in a way that capitalizes on our sustainability efforts. So there are green bonds, sustainability bonds uh, that are out there. It's unclear to me, other people will of course say different things, that the amount of effort required to raise capital through a sustain, sustainability bond or a green bond are worth the small, you know, in terms of one, two, maybe five basis points difference sometimes, are worth the small decrease in the cost of, of, of financing. So it's just been my anecdotal evidence anyways, that most firms that I talk to say, you know, we're really issuing a green bond or a sustainability bond because it looks good. It's really good to signal to the market that we're they're interested in this, but it's certainly not something that's that's um, uh, generating them funds in any sort of meaningfully inexpensive uh, way, given the cost, because it is much more costly to raise, raise in this framework. Now, from the demand side, so from the investor's perspective, 
Uh, there's a huge demand, and you can see that that huge demand in how, um, how financial institutions and data providers are trying to find every possible way to package or repackage firms, indices, cash flows, bonds in a way that is um, sort of promotes sustainability. So putting green indices together, ESG ratings. So I think there is a is a you know there's a lot of demand, particularly from large pension funds, but also from individual retail investors for sustainability, sustainability investments. And the supply of these investments, I think, is mostly being filled by financial intermediaries and less so by the firms and by financial intermediaries in the form of repackaging, remarketing cash flows uh, from firms and also selling a lot of the uh, a lot of the data. So I think there's a um, if we do have anywhere that we need to improve, it's on making it easier for firms to engage in sustainability um, projects and efforts and have those be adequately rewarded in the capital markets. Can I just add on to that just real briefly? Um, uh, very interesting change in how investors view ESG issues. And I've been working with investors for close to 20 years uh, at Alcoa in one form or another. Uh, I would have told you uh, when I first became CFO eight years ago, uh, if, if, uh, if I had one out of 20 investors ask me about ESG, um, I would usually kind of roll my eyes and think that this is gonna be one of those uh, discussions. Um, and uh, I would tell you now, um, we would probably, I would say 19 out of 20 investors uh, talk to me about ESG type issues. I would put those, the, the, the reason for that in two buckets. Uh, the first is um, investors are trying to determine uh, uh, the risk level a company has towards ESG issues. In our industry, um, there are tailings dams, there are uh, you know, and, and many of you probably are familiar with the Brumaginho impact uh, the, that uh, where one of the tailing dams collapsed, killed 300 people, and this was in uh, the, this was in the metals and mining industry, not in the aluminum industry. Um, uh, the focus today on around impoundments in our industry is massive because people are trying to determine: Do you have any chance of having one of those binary uh, events that can wipe uh, billions of dollars of uh, market capitalization off your uh, off your market cap? That's the first. The second is also an evolving group, which is really looking for, can you drive competitive strategic advantage through ESG? Can you be a better investment? Can you earn outsized rents through the ESG initiatives? So those are the, the, those are the reasons that I think we're getting more ESG type questions today from investors. Thanks, thanks Mr. Applinger. Um, the next question is for you, Ms. Chung. How do you see your clients' needs changing with respect to sustainability? Specifically, has the mix of products changed or has the items you're concentrating your reporting and analytics on changed? Uh, well, I think Ryan actually um, answered both for, for the financial markets as well as for us because we are one of the information providers that, uh, that um, he referenced. Um, but, I mean, I'd say we've been in this market for about 20 years. Uh, we had the first um, ESG index, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Uh, it's been outstanding for about 20 years. Uh, we um, uh, we reached a see, recently rather uh, acquired the data and survey provider that was our partner for that index. Uh, so it's a company called Rubico Sam. And uh, we've integrated their ESG scores of data, uh, not just um, uh, it was already uh, integrated in the indices, but we've integrated that into our credit rating agency as the um, uh, underlying sort of uh, scoring inputs, if you like, uh, that our credit rating analysts look, like, look at. And uh, we also offer the data, the analytics, et cetera, through, uh, through the division that I run, which is uh, Mark Intelligence Division. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting, and I won't repeat everything that, that Ryan said because it was a, a good setup. Um, you know, the asks are very broad, the needs are very broad. Um, I would say uh, we have seen our um, uh, Paris lines indices outperform uh, the core indices by over 5% through September this year. We saw the uh, ESG indices outperform the 500 core benchmark by uh, about two, two and a half percent this year. So 
definitely seeing, um, uh, to Bill's point, that opportunity for longer term, uh, you know, performance uh, uplift uh, with uh, with companies that are, you know, more aligned to whatever standards or, or thematically uh, investors are interested in. Um, I think one of the the things that's going to become difficult to do uh, over the next uh, couple of years is, you know, as we uh, go beyond, um, you know, kind of the, the stress testing frameworks that um, Galena mentioned, NGFS, et cetera, and we get into more uh, fundamental modeling of, uh, of some of these risks. There's, there's going to be, I think, some interesting work that needs to be done. So we're also working with the um, Coalition for Climate Re Responsible Investments to actually try to look at the implications for physical risk, for example, on um, assets. Uh, in this instance, we're focused on infrastructure assets. So we're looking at both cash flow as well as uh, um, valuation uh, of an asset as a result of physical risk. So there's, this is going to get a lot more technical, I think, over the next couple of years in terms of the needs uh, for our clients. Uh, and we're uh, very focused on that. Thanks, Chung. In the interest of time for the next four questions that are all still directed at one person, I'd like just to hear your thoughts, your, uh, the person, the person that the question is directed at, at thoughts um, so that we can get to some audience questions. Dr. Hale, in the context of your work at the Federal Reserve, do you see financial markets equipped to respond to emergent sustainability issues like climate change? It's actually a very good uh, segue from what uh, Martina was just talking about. So um, I think the main issue that both uh, market information providers like S&P are facing and the regulators uh, in the financial industry are facing is the lack of definitions and data. Uh, and there is no uniform standard for what is, you know, um, you know, sustainability compliant or not. A number of central banks now do climate stress testing uh, for their banking industry. So in their capacity as bank regulator, and that's one good way to incentivize the banks to review their evaluation of the physical and transition risks. The difficulty is, uh, you know, for st normal stress testing, that uh, we do at the Fed, for example. We provide a scenario that's either six months for the financial markets shock or nine quarters for the macroeconomic shock. And then the banks use their models to evaluate their losses and the drops of earnings during those time periods. Okay, And so based on that, they need to have enough capital buffer. So the incentives get aligned that if they don't have enough capital buffer, if they don't evaluate the risks correctly, the stick of the regulator is that they can't distribute dividends that year, and that, that works very effectively. The difficulty with the climate risks is that transition risks, um, sorry, physical risks become material mostly beyond the time horizon of the maturity of most of their assets. Okay, so I actually saw a TCFD report of one of the large banks. Uh, they're, they're all public, you can read them. Um, where basically the conclusion was that their exposure is minimal, if, if any, because most of their assets are less than 10 years maturity. So then you can say, well, they're not subject to physical risk. And the scenario they're used for um, the transition risk was the Paris scenario, which has a very smooth transition uh, without major asset repricing and major breakdown of the financial system. Right, so they didn't have much of a transitional risk either. And so that's kind of a bit of a, a jam that you find yourself because the median scenario for climate is not going to materialize. Either we're gonna take action and we're gonna be experience a lot of transition asset repricing and stranded assets, or we're going to end up with much more uh, of a temperature increase and much bigger physical risks than the Paris scenario. Right? So just using the median kind of scenario is not going to generate any risks. Um, and so that's one, you know, one of the work streams of NGFS is dedicated exactly to trying to figure out what's the best way to model the risks. The industry 
uh, has its own uh, effort to figure out what's the right way to model those risks. And it's very complicated because even if you do it at the very granular industry level, so let's take Alcoa as an example, within an industry, you can't just have an industry average climate risk because each company is going to have a different uh, different approach and different actions they take. And so we need, uh, you know, maybe a, a rating agency specifically designed to rating ESG risks or a government agency, maybe some agency like EPA could be a certifier for, for something like that. The European Commission came up with um, uh, uh, taxonomy of the industries at the very granular level but they only have green versus non-green, which then of course, uh, you know, is upsetting the industries that are carbon neutral because they're bunched together with carbon emitting industries. So it, a lot of, you know, political barriers, technological barriers, lack of knowledge, lack of, lack of data. I must say though, when I started looking at the climate issues, there is so much more data available than in almost any other field of economics where you can just, you know, get online and grab any scenario you want. And so, but at the very detailed level, it's, it's very technical work and data gathering work is what's needed right now. Thank you, Dr. Hale. Dr. Evans, over the past decade in the United States, we've witnessed a revolution in the power generation sector, specifically with respect to the rise of natural gas and renewables. Can you discuss the role of public environmental or energy policy during such a time? So uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep this really short and focus on this part. Now I do wanna take a step back though. I need to take a sure what my background is. So I'm working in the National Center for Environmental Economics. I am a senior economist. There's actually a few of us. And what we do in the National Center is we help our program offices, air, water, solid waste, work on benefit cost analyses that are prepared for regulatory impact analyses, which are required by executive order. That's our bread and butter. And we set guidelines for how we should do that sort of work. And in order to draw folks like me, we also do cutting edge research to actually advance the methodologies for benefit cost analysis. So where I come from, my specific role in that group is I do a lot of our work, a lot with the air office, but the other program offices on electricity regulation. So the quote unquote war on coal, uh, a lot of the issues that sort of come around have been thought about in our office and things that I've worked on in terms of thinking about the electricity sector. There's a lot to unpack in the question that was asked. So I really want to focus on something. And it was really great hearing William in particular talking about wanting a, a durable long run incentive and a price and what that really means and having it widely covered. That was a great discussion. Because what I do want to say in this transition period and as things are moving around and well-designed environmental regulation can hit a moving target. It can hit a moving target. If we know what a damage per ton is, and we set a fee for that damage per ton, right? And we have a reason talking about that. The whole point in terms of economic efficiency is it doesn't really matter then what the baseline is. The amount of reduction that's going to occur, a durable uh, uh, strategy, that's going to work. Now, we don't have that authority at EPA. I don't want to act like we do, but that's what, you know, the economist from the academic perspective. And so it's interesting hearing all that. Of course, there are challenges and we've been pointed out, you know, having homogenous policy across the globe is not going to happen. Uh, but also in terms of quantity restrictions, starting off modestly, these are things we can sort of, you know, if one is worried about risk in terms of, you know, political risk in some sense, but of course it's also an economic risk of, of, of short-term harm, incrementally tightening caps I think can really happen. And that will allow us to sort of see, set, it helps set a durable uh, 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 signal, but it helps us see, you know, well, how fast can we move these trade-offs that we're going to make? Um, and I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to stop there. Thank you very much. I have one more question. Uh, this one is going to be directed at you, Mr. Hartner. Uh, Mr. Applinger, if you'd like to respond as well, uh, we can. But in the interest of time, I'd like you to collectively keep the response brief. Are there any trends that X1 or Alcoa sees from similar companies? And how is your approach similar or different to those? trends in, in your industries? 
I, I, I'd say most manufacturers, frankly, are fairly conservative. They're not changing dramatically their life. Um, they, they, they have an established business. They've been in business for years. However, uh, frankly, this, this crisis has caused several, and I would say starting to be a trend of people, whether it's firms or entrepreneurs, to stand up and say they've got to do it differently. They've got to look at different supply chains that are going to either uh, you know, reshore or make more sustainable products. Um, you know, whether you're talking about kind of the moonshot situation, um, a SpaceX or, or a, a Tesla. Um, and, you know, you know we're work, we work with a bunch of EV companies that are trying to lightweight so you don't have to stop at a charging station quite as often. Uh, but, uh, or whether you're trying to use uh, technology to combine parts and, and have rocket engines that are both reusable and that, that they can use have more thrust per pound. Um, and that, you know, from firms to entrepreneurs, we've got, uh, you know, a really cool company in Germany who's taking, uh, again, thinking differently, using um, organic waste and reconstituting that into bathroom fixtures. So if you go into a, let's see, a boutique hotel in Berlin, you're going to see this cool organic sink um, rather than him importing that from uh, Guangdong in China. So there, there are people that are starting to think differently, whether it's because of necessity of the COVID scenario, tariff, you know, future regulatory issues with, uh, with carbon. Um, but I, I, I'm encouraged by those customers and, and, and part of the fun of my job is to do work with them every day. Um, entrepreneurs, firms that are saying, we've got to think differently if we're going to both run a successful company, have successful products, and uh, operate within the, the future uh, regimes of, of sustainability. And, I, and I'll just pass on the last one and we can get to get to questions from, from the audience. Excellent. Thank you all so much. Uh, the next question is a question from our audience. How can we shorten the horizon that we've talked about here um, across industries and sectors? How can we create or amplify solutions for today's environmental crisis? Is it a regulatory issue, a technological solution issue? Where do we specifically need to focus in order to make financial transformation happen? Uh, I'll uh, jump in. Uh, I, I won't punt to use the, the football vernacular. Um, so I, I think the important thing uh, is to, to, and this is gonna sound, uh, it's gonna sound obvious, but is to just get started. Uh, is, you know, not to see, let's say, you know, Paris Accord 2030, we've got to reduce by 30%. That sounds like too much and it's gonna be too much, you know, too expensive. You know, let, let's think about ways that we can reduce 1%, 2%, 5% right now or next year or in the very near, near, near future. And so I think, Anything from a technological perspective, taking technologies that are already well used, well understood, roll them out, scale them up, make them easier to access. You know, the, the example with, uh, with EVs and EV charging stations, you know, just really small scale infrastructure just to make it easier to use existing technologies, uh, I think is important. Small nudges from, uh, from the federal government. I know, for instance, in Canada, retrofitting is a large sort of easy way to think about um, and reducing emissions. We're cold, we're always cold. And we, you know, you had the example of Germany. My wife's German, I spend a lot of time there. The houses are built really well there, not so much in Ottawa. So retrofitting, uh, you know, just these small little incremental changes, I think will make it easier to accelerate. And it takes from this, I think the psychological barrier where people feel like, well, you know, the train's already left the station. It's too hard, it's insurmountable. I don't understand what to do and to make it just like bite size, make it really easy to consume step by step is what you know, everyone, uh, uh, everyone can do. Yeah, one point, uh, one point I'd make is just, uh, I think we got to take advantage of this crisis and say, as we're deploying, whether it's stimulus dollars or people that want to think differently, we've got to use this investment and the energies and the entrepreneurs to drive 
sustainable solution. We, we just can't back off of that. We can't say it's status quo. We've got to push harder, even though it sounds like it's daunting, but I, I think this is a unique opportunity for us. And I, I hope that whether it's individuals or governments take advantage of that. I, I want to follow up on both of these comments. So um, there is a lot of solution, um, possible solutions that also are job generating. And that's why now uh, it's really kind of a window of opportunity that we have. And a large portion of carbon emissions does come from the building energy consumption, uh, residential as well as the office buildings. A lot of office buildings are standing empty now. It's now a great time to retrofit them. And in terms of residential buildings, you know, that creates a, a lot of local uh, jobs that, you know, could be done. And so it's absolutely uh, an opportunity that I hope won't be missed. Thank you very much. Are there any examples of programs or initiatives that have or should be implemented that can have an outsized impact? I can mention really briefly in the UK, uh, they passed regulation to be completely coal free by I think 2024, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and they, that means um, all the retrofit of residential heating systems and things like that in uh, you know, centralized heating systems. And uh, that's a very near term by now. And I think they're, uh, they're going to get to that goal and it's going to have a big impact in a small country, right? But nobody says that you can't do it in other countries. Um, Penny, there's a, um... A great example in Australia, where they, they've had a, I uh, can't remember the exact name of it, but I think it's something to the tune of the National Green Infrastructure Bank, um, something to the tune of that. Um, but the institution was the largest of the world in the world when it was set up, and uh, and its goal was to essentially um, uh, crowd and financing uh, required to you know actually uh, fund some of these technology innovations, um, you know, regardless of sector. And so they would co-invest uh, with private sector uh, investors who oftentimes need, you know, kind of maybe to balance long-term horizon versus short-term horizon on their return. Um, that was enormously successful. And one of the other things that they did was, um, uh, you know, they actually provided um, uh, support for uh, uh, the actual uh, commercial banks within Australia to do sustainability linked loans uh, and uh, and incentives to do that as well. And so I think that's a good example of um, something that, uh, you know, that involves sort of public private partnership that could be a very positive move uh, to, to have capital flow into uh, to these uh, areas for investment. Thanks, Yo. Next audience question. Are there real world examples where companies are actually growing in financial performance, but not consuming more material resources? Um, I can give one example. Uh, they were the winner of our Global Energy Awards in Platts uh, two years ago, um, Orsted, uh, which is a, a Danish energy company, uh, which essentially within, I think, a 13, 14 year time horizon effectively completely exited fossil fuels uh, and reinvented themselves in renewables, including solar and offshore wind, uh, and have had a stunning return on the investment. Next question is directed at you, Dr. Evans. Do you have any thoughts on how we might be able to take the sustainability lessons that the US government is learning from the Department of Defense and disseminate them into other government agencies? You know, it's a really good question. And it, it, as I was thinking about, you know, that answer and putting that, that out there, that possibility, I, I was wondering about it. You know, I think in part, it's not just the, the other government agencies, although that's in part the ones I was thinking of, it was the American public, right? I mean, if, uh, and, and thinking that if the Department of Defense is taking some of these issues like, like global water risk seriously, climate risk seriously, 
in terms of others. In terms of uh, uh, the solution driving, I think it's seeing the, the possibility of innovation. I think sometimes we think of the DOD as being goggles and things like that. And of course they do make mistakes. Um, but in, you know, desalinization units, the small, small scale of those, how to dispatch those. I, I sort of said it's more than procurement, but in particular in procurement, if you look at the recent sustainability report of DOD, they, they reduced something like potable water consumption by 30% at their installations. That's massive. This is a massive organization that's doing this. And however the heck they did that, as long as they were measuring that Delta right, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how you circulate that or show that, and, and, but it, it, it certainly needs to get out there. It's a great question. Thanks, Dr. Think more. I'll think, I'll think about it more. <laughs> yeah, actually, the one other thing I'd say on the DOD is I, I can tell you that there are a range of programs that are being, whether DOE, DOD, DOE, on uh, leveraging technology, in my case, additive manufacturing, putting, let's say, distributed um, machines to the field such that they can produce spare parts, keep, keep uptime, and not have to wait for something to fly across the world for a, a small spare part. I think there's some innovative minds there. I mean, as David said, these are these are experiments. Not all of them are going to work. They're going to get thrown against the wall, and some will stick. Um, I, I, uh, I'm encouraged by some of that spending and some of that thinking, uh, such that um, you know I, I do have a belief that there will be a more sustainable uh, defense force out there in the future. Thank you for your insight. We have a student in the audience with a growing interest in who is studying computer science and has a growing interest in blockchain, blockchain technology as a sustainable solution. They have asked, do you all see blockchain technology as an area of interest and part of a sustainable solution for your industry? No, and uh, I'll, I'll answer for our company, not, not at this time. And um, uh, we need to study it more. We need to understand it more. I know it's been on the horizon now for a few years. Um, it's just not on our radar screen for implementation in our company and in our industry. And if you have, you, you the student that asked the question, have a great idea of how we can implement it uh, and, uh, and improve our company, our industry, we'd love to hear it. I'll jump in and just uh, and and just give you my perspective. You know, the other half of my professional persona is uh, in fintech, so in financial technology. So blockchain is certainly one of these one of these things. And I think what's missing right now is not the technology. I think that uh, blockchain technology is relatively mature, but it's it's the business case or the economics, right? How do you get incentives to uh, to somehow represent carbon emissions on a blockchain? why verifying them in a blockchain, blockchain type way is useful. And then how do you, uh, how do you monetize the, you know, the CO2 that's sort of blocked in the blockchain? So it's not a, a I, I think, and I think that's what you were saying uh, as well, William, is that it's just not clear what the business case is to, to putting sort of carbon emissions or sustainability on a blockchain. Why is it that we need a blockchain to, to verify block? Why do we need distributed trust? And I think I, I would agree if someone can come up with the economics, then it's a really straightforward uh, implementation would be useful. But I think you need to think clearly through the through, through the economic or the business case of, of why the blockchain uh, or what, what kind of problems would the blockchain solve. And it's I've thought about it actually a lot recently, and I've been unable to come up with a, a reason that we would need to use blockchain to solve some of the problems in, uh, in, in the area. But uh, you know, I'm not the only one thinking about this. Okay. Thank you. The next question, uh, an observation, the discussion is focused a lot on carbon so far. What else can private industry or other institutions like the finance sector do to support sustainability efforts? on this. Um, so I think a lot of um, 
climate change efforts in particular focus on CO2 emissions and a lot of human capital is definitely going there, but it's important to keep in mind that CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. There is methane, there is nitrous oxide. And the issue is not just emissions, it's also resource use. And so additive manufacturing is one of the solutions for sustainability because it's using less materials to make the same stuff we, we've been making. Yes, I'm a big fan. Um, but also there are other aspects, right? So, so one area I'm focusing on now, and I feel like there is not enough human capital in that is food system sustainability. The population is growing and we're kind of at the point of this Malthusian uh, reckoning again, right? Can we sustain the population growth we have compound with the changes in diets, especially in Asia, towards larger share of animal food consumption um, as the incomes grow. Uh, you know, animal products consume a lot more resources than plant-based products. So without some kind of change in what we think is appropriate food is pretty much the math that doesn't work out, right? With the population growing and the diets changing away from sustainability. And so, and there are many more areas on this, you know, and the population growth itself is also a question. So, you know, education of women, you know, the ability in lower income countries to, uh, uh, you know, manage a family. Uh, so all these issues are, are very important. So I want to encourage the students to think beyond just the CO2 emissions, which is an important and probably the most pressing issue, but it's not the only issue. Yeah, I just want to pick up on that real quick on the, that there's more than just the climate change. You know, when I was saying about the $20 bills on the sidewalk at the beginning, I'm thinking there are things now, there are things now where we have really strong evidence that the benefits outweigh the costs. And doing that might not necessarily get you climate and things like that, but it's still worthwhile. Like climate's hugely important, but it can't, it can't suck the air out of the room while we're addressing it. And other things like just renewable resource management. If you don't think of the environment as things like fishery, health. And if you don't think of it as forestry health, you, you know, then I'm going to tell, you know, it's, so that's not what you meant by environment, but I think of it as environment, the whole thing's like environment. But uh, if, if those things too really ought to be focused on. And if we make institutional improvements there that are, that are durable, that's going to make all these other challenges in terms of this perspective that I have, that's really about total well-being of future societies, better off, easier to maintain. And I would just add, um, uh, for our, our industry, we're on the forefront of so many sustainability issues. And, and as I said earlier on, sustainability is, is much broader than CO2. It's much broader than the environment for our industry. It, it is um, now uh, some, of the, some of the focus areas are on um, community engagement. Does our industry bring more benefit to a community than it actually uh, hurts the community, and we try to measure, uh, you know, how much benefit we bring to certain communities. Um, and then even down in places like uh, uh, Australia, if you're if you're in Australia these days, you hear a lot about indigenous human uh, human rights, indigenous people's rights, and that is becoming an emerging issue all over the world uh, for where we do business that uh, have indigenous people's uh, rights. So these are some of the things that uh, that, that are on uh, our radar at this point. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this has been an excellent panel. I've had a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to wrap up now. I'd like to thank all six of our panelists, the Tepper School, the Scott Institute, and of course, our audience. Uh, thank you for attending, and please have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Bye-bye.